So already you might be like, this is kind of weird, right? Most security teams don't typically have software engineers. Uh, Facebook is a, we have over 10,000 employees. Many people push code, uh, many people touch things in production. Uh, and so we actually have the luxury of having enough people that we can dedicate a team of software engineers, which is the team that I work on, specifically towards making our infrastructure better and making it more secure by design. So a lot of you guys work for startups, a lot of you guys maybe want to start startups. Um, eventually your company will get large enough that security reviews are no longer going to be uh, an acceptable part of your development process. We push code multiple times a day and we can't let people be the blocker in getting code out. We have to have something better. And we've noticed during our time, uh, tools scale a lot better than people scale. And so my team builds things that help us make sure the entire code base is secure. So, Today I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about some things that we've learned. Uh, I'm going to give you some specific examples of things that we've done uh, and just generally let you, get, let you know what has helped us as we've scaled our organization and hopefully there are some lessons that you can take home. So the way that we think about security at Facebook, uh, sorry this is my own terrible security analogy, uh, is we think about Facebook uh, kind of like a house. So Melanie's mentioned before, like when you leave, we, we work for the same company, so we have the same analogy. Um, when you leave your house, you lock your front door, right? And so like if you don't lock your front door, then you kind of don't have this expectation of, of security. But like that's a step that you need to take. So there is a lot of vulnerable stuff, there's a lot of valuable stuff inside Facebook. We have a lot of data, we have a lot of trust that our users have given us. And so there are a lot of things that other people, like burglars breaking into your house, might potentially want. And so when we think about that, and we think about all the different people that are touching our stuff, like all the different people that aren't on the security team, all of our roommates that don't necessarily remember to lock the door, that's a risk that we don't necessarily want to take. So if you have roommates, uh, you know that harassing them constantly to lock the door is not the best way to get the job done. Uh, and so that is not actually what we do at Facebook. So there are a lot of best practices, uh, and best practices are awesome. So when you're small, you can do security reviews, you can set up systems, you can do pen testing, you can monitor your network infrastructure, you can do, you can buy all sorts of intrusion detection products. But ultimately, if you're pushing out code at the rate that we're pushing it out, catching things after they happen is not going to be good enough. You need to actually make sure that you're not constantly um, making your system more vulnerable every time you push code. And so we try to engineer that in. So much like when, much like if your roommates don't remember to close the door, rather than yelling at them, you can just buy an auto-closing door. And so we look for opportunities to do this whenever possible. Um, and so my team works to identify potential issues, build tools to solve them through engineering, and have this all be an automated process so that all of our doors end up getting closed. So today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how we identify problems in our organization. So strategies for figuring out what you can build that's going to have the highest impact. Uh, I have two case studies for you of real-world tools that we've used. Uh, one is open source and one is internal. Uh, and then I have some, less, some general lessons and principles that you guys can follow at home. <coughs> okay, so uh, there are a lot of problems. How do we figure out what to work on? So uh, my team is full of engineers. We work on a lot of things. Uh, so here are some technologies that we use internally, uh, PHP, MySQL, Hive, so Hive is our big data warehouse whenever you have any sort of Hadoop infrastructure. Uh, it's always a little bit challenging to lock that down. Um, we have uh, OS Query and HHVM are two of our open source tools, two, two tools that were built that we then open sourced. Uh, so OS Query lets you monitor your network traffic in real time uh, and lets you ask questions about your system. Um, HHVM is our compiled version of PHP. Um, so we got some security benefits from doing that as well. Uh, we also have a bug bounty program, uh, much as many companies do. Uh, we have personally found this to be incredibly valuable. The bug bounty program is great for a variety of reasons. So one, yes, it's cheaper than you know having constant pen testers. Um, but secondly, you can see what people are looking at. You can kind of get an idea about where attackers are looking at your system, where they think you might be vulnerable. And so that kind of gives us a heads up on what people are thinking about so we can look inside our system and determine what's going on. Um, so if we get a bunch of white hat reports that have the same general theme or looking at the same parts, that's an awesome indication of this is how people are thinking. And that's something that you can't get internally. You have to go outside to see what the researchers are really doing. We've also gotten uh, a lot of good hires through the bug bounty program. So sometimes researchers don't want to lead a life of crime. Sometimes researchers want a more regular paycheck than a bug bounty. Uh, and so sometimes they want to come work for you. 
So that's great. You can find some really cool engaged people through your bug bounty program as well. So the invariant detector is an internal tool that we have that actually came out of some white hat reports. So we started getting a bunch of white hat reports that had a similar theme. Uh, I'll show you an example of one of those uh, exploits. Um, and so we built this tool in order to uh, solve, this, in order to proactively solve this problem. So from computer science, uh, invariant is something that should always be the same. Uh, so the invariant detector is something that we use to look at our traffic, figure out what things should always be constant, and then if something violates one of these invariants, then we know it's an and then we know it's an anomaly. Okay, so I have a video for you guys. So let us play it. Okay. So what's going on here is we launched a feature that was common with photo. So you can take this photo, you can post a comment. So what's going on here is he's got this cute photo. This isn't his photo. Uh, and he's going to post it on his friend's wall. So he's taking this photo that doesn't belong to him, and he shared it via, he's going to share it beyond the intended audience. So his friend that owns the photo is maybe not happy about this. Um, maybe he's not. Uh, he wasn't intending to share it with this audience, and like now additional people are seeing it. So this is really bad from a user privacy perspective. We don't want users to feel like the data that they share might be shared beyond the audience of people that they want to share it with. It's super important to us. And whenever anybody shares it on Facebook, they're in control of who's going to have it and who's going to be able to see that thing. There was actually an additional side effect. Um, so by posting that comment, the original uh, person actually took ownership of that photo. So not only was he able to share it beyond the intended audience, but now this photo actually belongs to him. And so he's going to do something interesting that you will probably see why we wanted to prevent this. So yeah, he's just showing proof of concept, like he took this object and he's calling an API point, uh, an API endpoint. And now he owns this photo. So what would you do with something that doesn't belong to you? So he deletes this comment um, and deletes the photo. Uh, so as you can see, the photo is gone. So this is like really not good. Um, so not only did he take this photo that didn't belong to him, he showed it to a bunch of people that shouldn't have seen it, and then he deleted it. So that's not great. So you can imagine if this was not a cute photo of that kid from Up, like perhaps it is one of Mark Zuckerberg's family photos, like perhaps it is something, perhaps it's like sensitive, we, we don't want this sort of thing to happen. Um, but it also seems like it's pretty obvious why this happened. Like, there's this pattern, right? Like, he took this object, he shouldn't have had access to it, he shouldn't have been able to share it with other people, he shouldn't have been able to post it because he didn't own it. That was the relationship. And so, um, if we could see those sorts of patterns, we thought we could identify when these sorts of things could happen. So, our solution. Most of our code actually does work properly, uh, and so we like to leverage this. So we get a ton of traffic every day. We have a ton of requests coming in. So what we do is we look at those, we look at all the, that traffic, and we look for properties that are equivalent. So we've got a system that samples the traffic, um, actually samples real traffic, and then looks to see what properties are the same. And then if something if something is anomalous, uh, then we flag that violation. So basically, what we're saying is we find one observation a is equal to b. And then if we say, a, if we see a is equal to b in pretty much every case, and then all of a sudden a is equal to c, that's how we know that this is a violation. We want to block that. So how the system works. Uh, so we sample a percentage of every database write. So this is every single write to the system, like every single, every single time anybody tries to write anything to one of our production databases, uh, we end up, um, we sample that and keep track of all that traffic. We invert relationships between objects and look for equivalent properties. So what this means is we're looking for stuff like who are the friend, like who is who is the after, like who is in this thing. So are these two people friends? Like is this the advent of a group? Um, so one property might be like friend friend. Like if you want to post a comment, then the two people have to be friends. Um, and so we sample, uh, and then once it rules at 100% for two weeks, so that means every piece of traffic that we've seen is uh, every piece of traffic that we've seen is consistent then we end up launching this in production. Um, we tweak this around a little bit, and we notice this gives us good performance. So since we're actually going to end up blocking things, uh, we were pretty conservative in our sampling. So some examples of properties that we look at are the afters, so like who's actually doing this. Um, group admins, friendships, that sort of stuff. So really what we did was we looked at our traffic, looked at ways that we can figure out 
ways that things relate to one another, um, and then try to build up patterns of how things should look so we can do anomaly detection on top of that. So again, live rules are checked before every database write. So every time you go do anything on Facebook that would result in a database write, so posting a comment, looking at, uh, posting a photo, likes, anything like that, uh, we check that. And if one of these rules is violated, then we block the write. So if you call some endpoint, uh, that if you call some endpoint uh, then and try to do something that's not legitimate, we will block that. We also monitor our internal and external endpoints separately, which is something important to note. So depending on um, the developer versions of your site uh, might have different traffic patterns and people might have additional permissions that your normal users don't have. So for instance, we have a bunch of community operations people that need to be able to do password resets. We don't want to block them resetting those passwords just because they're not the owners of those accounts. Like they actually explicitly have permissions to do that. But similarly, that's traffic that we shouldn't be seeing on the main site, so we have to monitor those things separately. So we launched this in March 2014, uh, and we have about 15,000 rules, and they've caught dozens of violations. So you might say, like, dozens of violations, like this doesn't seem like a lot of bang for your buck. Um, but actually, each of these things would be pretty bad. Like you saw that video, like that was pretty embarrassing. If that happened on Mark Zuckerberg's profile, that would be really bad. Um, and so even though it might not sound like there was a huge amount of impact, for us, this solved a problem that we would have only been able to solve by going through basically our entire code base, looking at every single endpoint, and trying to figure and testing. So now we're able to discover these problems proactively, we're able to prevent them, um, and also we're able to see when these rights are coming in, we can see where they come from, and then we can go fix problems as they come up. So it was actually pretty great. Okay, so the second uh, case study is about preventing errors from getting into your code before they even happen. So at, at uh, Facebook, we, uh, we write a lot of PHP. Some people think this might be a questionable choice, um, but uh, we have a lot of awesome tools that make it a lot easier for our developers to write. Uh, so XHP and JSX are two ways that we've changed the way that developers write code inside Facebook to try to prevent, um, to try to prevent bad code from ever getting checked in. So the motivation for these two tools was cross-site scripting prevention. Um, so just a, everyone probably knows this already, um, but cross-site scripting prevention, uh, cross-site scripting errors are when you let users execute code in your application that you're not intending. Um, and so you've got some hacker, they take advantage of the fact that you're bad at sanitizing HTML to execute something directly, uh, and then they're able to escalate permissions, get data, get data or whatnot. And so writing HTML is terrible. It's really easy to write bad HTML if you're just writing it raw. Like you could do stuff like not sanitize stuff, or you can even do things as easy as forget to close your tabs. So writing HTML is a pain. Um, it's uh, and we have a really big website. There's a lot of HTML. So this is something that we would like to avoid. There's just too many opportunities for errors. So there are kind of three schools of thought about how to prevent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Um, one of them is that. If you're a developer writing front-end web code, it's your responsibility to be a security expert, and you need to know how to prevent these problems. Well, we don't like to do that. Uh, we don't think that everyone at your organization should have to know uh, everything about security in order to keep your site secure. We like to solve this using tools. This is the point of the presentation, so you should know that we don't do this. Um, the other option is you can accept raw inputs, but then just sanitize all of them. String sanitization is really annoying. Uh, sanitizing things is annoying, uh, so we don't do this either. Again, this is kind of the responsibility of the developer, or like we would have to write some tool, some library that people have to use. That also sounds terrible. So actually what we do uh, is we generate HTML uh, in a better language. Uh, and so these are these two tools that we use in order to do this. So XHP and JSX allow developers to programmatically generate HTML. No longer do you need to remember to close your tags. They will just happen for you. Um, as a bonus, the HTML does not get malformed. You don't have to deal with your own CSS styling. Um, I am not a front-end developer, and like part of this is why. <laughs> this is terrible. HTML is not fun. I don't care about pixels. Um, and so now, someone that actually likes to do those things gets to do them for the whole company. Uh, also, as a bonus, you can actually have self-generating tags. So like we've got all these awesome libraries full of things that you can just include, and like I don't have to care about whether the like button needs to be three pixels to the right. Um, and actually, both of these tools are open source. So if you write PHP or uh, using HHVM, or if you're using the React library, you can go home and use these, or use them here in the audience. So uh, as an aside, templating is another solution to this. Um, templating is ugly and not very fun. Um, so here are two common templating languages for PHP. 
Uh, templating actually still requires you to write HTML, so it doesn't really solve our problem. Uh, it's hard to reuse templates, you have to copy and paste things, you need to write controllers. This is not really a solution to the problem. So if in the back of your mind you're thinking, why didn't you do this, like this seems hard, um, this is why, because that's not that much better. So some real examples. I'm going to put code up. I'm a software engineer, so get excited. I'm excited. Um, so here's some HTML. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a cross-site scripting vulnerability in this. So the cross-site scripting, I'll let you guys read it. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> so the cross-site scripting vulnerability is right there, right? So we're taking this name, we're immediately um, executing it, and it's inside the span, and we're just like kind of throwing it back. So like literally anything could happen. Like we don't know what this is. So this is what XHP looks like. Um, you might say that this looks pretty similar, and in fact it does. Um, things to note, we actually do not need to, uh, so things to note are that there are, there's some syntactic sugar in there, so we don't end up um, echoing this raw string. So we can actually do type checking through HHVM. So we can look at this, this post, um, and we can say that the result of this is supposed to be a string. And if it's not a string, then um, we'll know that it's not what we expect. So that's pretty cool. That's something that you can't do um, in regular HTML. That's kind of a side effect of using HHVM. Um, it's also a little bit cleaner. Um, I would argue that this is better. Um, and we also know that this post is being used as HTML, so we can automatically escape it. Um, and so this tag in, in the tag library, we can deal with all of that. So this piece of code is actually, it's easier to read, um, it's probably going to be easier to maintain, and it's automatically more secure. So not only did we get a developer benefit, because they didn't have to write HTML, um, we got a lot of security benefits from this as well, so that's pretty cool. So another example. Um, so we often use components, and so this is an example um, of something that uses the HTML, uh, that uses the XHP components instead. Um, so we have a library full of UI components, here we have um, a couple of components. So like we've got like this messages, and like settings, and like all of these buttons and things. Uh, so those are actually now able to be shared amongst everything. And so this is also really convenient because if we update something in one place, it gets updated everywhere. Um, so that is pretty cool. So the, the key here, I think the key takeaway here is like, we noticed that there was this problem. We have this website. And in order to solve it, we couldn't, there are a couple solutions existing. But rather than do that, we decided to invest in this architecture and really change the way that our developers wrote code in order to prevent this problem from ever happening to begin with. So we have, whenever anybody um, commits new code to the code base, they use these new components. We now only have to audit one library, so we know that that library is secure. We've saved developer time because developers don't have to deal with making sure their HTML is good. Um, and so uh, everything new that's getting pushed to the site is going to be secure. Whenever anybody touches any of the old pages, we can make sure that they port all of them over to the new library. And if we ever want to change what the call button or message button or like button looks like, we only have to do that in one place. So this has had huge benefits, not only for security, but also for developer efficiency. And I think that's really the key takeaway with building tools. Like, if you can build tools that make your developers' lives easier, they're going to use them, and as a security team, like you're going to get a lot of benefits out of that as well. So a little bit about what we've learned. Um, so at, at a big organization, when you no longer have enough people that you can go to everybody's desk or manually audit all the code, um, and not everyone can be an expert. And honestly, like, we don't think everybody should have to be an expert. Your developers should be free to work on the things that they really want to work on. They should get to explore their passions. You hire them to do something, presumably because they were really excited about doing it. So let them do that. And if security isn't their thing, don't make them be security experts. We also noticed that tools make engineers more productive. So developer tools, I think, are like that one weird trick that you get to like scale your organization to 10,000 people. Like It's by giving them better tools, like use version control, like make your compile time slower. And also, if you want your code to be secure, you're going to have to make an investment in that. So once you have enough engineers, they are able to really start investing in developer tools. Consider focusing on things that also have security benefits as well. We also noticed that engineers love security, uh, or at least a lot of them do. Uh, security is fun, like security is cool. You can like tell them they can go to DEF CON if they like fix some vulnerabilities, like that's pretty fun. And so people actually really like to help. So we had to do an asset sell upgrade after Heartbleed, um, and we noticed that um, people all over the organization helped. Um, we actually had already patched it, so it was fine, but like people were pinging us and like saying like, hey, 
what's going on? Like, do you guys need assistance? Like, I read this thing. They come to us with problems in this because we come to them with solutions for problems that they already have. When the security team shows up, it's not scary. They're not here to do a security review. They're not here to yell at you. They're here to help. And we're engineers. We can do engineering work. So we can partner with other engineers across the organization, and then we can have this really great collaborative relationship. Um, and so we're in the middle of Hacktober, so uh, people are fixing vulnerabilities all over. They're like porting things to, um, they're porting like old components to uh, XHP and getting points. It's super fun. Um, and so people do want to help and they are curious. And so as a security team, if you don't like doing security reviews, this isn't your passion, you want to maybe do something a little bit different. Um, if you build great developer tools, this will free up your time to do things that you really want to do. Like ultimately, we want everyone at the company to be focusing on things that they love. Uh, and so our solution to that was to build tools. Um, so I am out of time. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to wax poetic about anything with sexy, sexy developer tools. Uh, but <laughs> come find me afterwards. Thank you.